In this session on the Amazon Typhoon Control software, we're going to look up how to set up a fluorescent imaging scan. You'll notice on here, the first thing you want to do is choose which stage we actually have in the system. So you'll see in one of the videos, you could set up to do adult gel for doing our dye work. You could be working with microtiter plates, or you could just be using the low fluorescent glass stage for doing a gel or a membrane. So I'll set up for doing a gel or a membrane here. Right now we have one scan area. We could create multiple scan areas just by clicking on the mouse and dragging over the respective areas on the plan. This is gonna help with file management if you have really, really high resolution and many, many samples you want to image. In this case, we're just gonna work with one gel or one membrane so we can delete the other ones just by clicking on the de delete on the keyboard. We want to choose a pixel size now. So pixel size is related to the resolution. 200 micron, we're just gonna use for testing or doing a quick check on what's going on. The 100 micron we'd use for a gel or a block larger than 10 by 10 centimeters. The 50 micron we'd use for a gel or a block smaller than 10 by 10 centimeters. Then the 25 and the 10 micron are gonna be for high resolution images such as a tissue section or an array. Now, if we look at the 25 microns, you'll see down here, we've got the file size and the scan time. If I go to the 10 micron, it's gonna be higher resolution, you'll see the scan time doesn't change, but the file size has increased quite a bit. The reason for the file size changing and the time staying the same is the 10 micron is actually made from the 25 micron image with math mathematical processing. So in this case, we're just gonna go for a 100 micron scan. You'll also notice that we have two choices for the scan speed. One is normal, which you'd normally recommend. You also have the option to go to slow. So when you go to slow, you'll see this time will increase here. And this is because it's gonna do a double pass over the sample. When it does a double pass, it will average out the signal. So it's gonna give you a little bit better sensitivity and a little bit better dynamic range. But in most instances, we'll work with the normal. You'll now see that we have the option to add different scans. If you're just doing a single fluorophore, then we can go straight from this drop down and choose a particular one that we're gonna use. If we wanted to add more multiple scans, we can just click on this add scan feature and we can actually go up to five sequential scans using the system. If you do not want to do five, we can just delete using the cross in the top right hand corner of the box. For the example we're gonna to do today, we're gonna to look at a membrane that has Psi 3 and Psi 5 in it. So from here, we can choose Psi 3, and our second scan will be Psi 5. If you've created any custom methods, they'll also be in this population on this drop-down list. We really have three ways we can set up to do a scan with the system. The first one is Auto PMT. If you use this method, it will automatically scan over the area at a very low res, so actually it will scan at 1,000 microns. It will then look at the pixel intensities within that image area and work out the correct voltage to apply to the photomultiplier tube. This can be a little dangerous if you don't know what is on your sample. You could have high molecular weight stuff left in the well on the gel, which has been transferred to the membrane. There could be molecular weight markers, a dye front, or some other artifact that you're not aware of. So it's usually safer to disengage the auto PMT and we can select a voltage here. Now the voltage for our photomultiplier tubes can be put anywhere between 250 to 1000 volts. In practice, the linearity is usually, in my experience, between about 350 to about 800 volts. Below that and above those parameters, it's not so linear. So you want to start off at the low end to do a, a semi-automatic scan. We'll explain how that works in a little while. If you have a good feeling for the starting voltage that you're usually working in with your sample, so after you've been using the machine for a while, you'll know your usual voltage range. But on a new sample, you're gonna start at the low end because you do not want to have saturated pixels because it's going to be difficult for the instrument with its algorithm to work out the correct voltage if you have saturated pixels. So you wanna build up to the, the strongest signal. So in this case, we'll choose both of these at 350 volts. 
And then we can go to this option, which is called pre-scan. So this will basically scan each channel in turn at a thousand microns. And then it's going to allow us to see that image. And then we can select a region or a band or whatever we want to calculate the correct PMT. So let's go ahead and hit pre-scan. It's going to scan sequentially. First it's going to do Psi 3, and then it's going to do Psi 5. And then we'll be able to look at these images in turn. So we can look at the Psi 3 image and the Psi 5 image. In this case, we're not seeing any bands because it's uh, a dummy software, but you'll be able to get the idea from what I'm about to perform now. So let's start off with the Psi 3 channel. Right now, on the right-hand side, in this display window, we can see the pixel intensity distribution over the image. We can adjust the contrast. This will not change our raw data. Just going to help us visualize what's going on. Right now, we're looking at the 100,000 grayscale image in this window here. And over here, you'll see the maximum intensity value in this pre-scan window. We can zoom in on a particular band or region of the window, and it will calculate the correct PMT for that particular band or part of the image that we're looking at. So in this case, it's saying 628 volts. This should avoid saturation. So we can click on that, and it'll seed it into this box here. We can do the same thing for the other channel, Psi 5, and we can select another area of interest here. In this case, it's saying 616 volts. So we can select that and place into the table here. There's another way you can use the system is to use this tab which says Estimated. When you click on that, you're enabling the ability to change the PMT artificially. And when you have saturation, you'll see the pink coloration come into the image window. I prefer to use this mode with the pre-scan by selecting the area for it to calculate the correct voltages. Now, if you had given it a name and file type and everything, we could go ahead and scan. We haven't done that yet, so we'll go back. And the other nice thing is when I go back now, whatever you've adjusted the contrast here, we're going to be able to see in our image window here. You don't see it so well here, but as I toggle between scan 1 and scan 2, if you had bands and things, they would be displayed in the window here. So that could enable you to help crop the scan area to be a little bit tighter if you needed to. As we go through here now, we need to give it a destination. It's very important we use a local hard drive. If you try and go through to the network or through to a USB stick, you're going to have a slowdown in file transfer. And then you'll get missing lines of information, which are so white lines across the image. So here, it's very important we go to the local hard drive. I'm going to go to this folder here. We need to give it a file name. And now we need to choose the file formats. So we have three different types of file format. They're all 16-bit images. The 16-bit TIFF is your generic 16-bit TIFF that everybody can kind of open and work with. Uh, some people are happy working with this .amg file, so that's another option. Historically from GE, we've worked with .gel files, so this gives you a 100,000 grayscale image. And this is kind of recommended to get the best aspect for quantitation. But memory is cheap, so let's take them all and kind of worry about it later, just in case somebody decides that they wanted to analyze with something else. Then we'll make sure they're all available to us. If we were doing this method every time we came into the machine, then we have the option to go here and save the method. So let's do that. In this case, we'll call it Psi3 and Psi5. Hit OK. Now what could happen is somebody else could come in to use the machine and you'll notice now after I've saved the method, it's now falling under this custom list here. We'll have defaults which are built into the system, which are in square parentheses. Then up here, we'll have the top five custom methods. So if the same people are coming in and using the same method over and over again, it'll populate to the top of the list here. So let's say somebody came in and just did a standard single channel scan, and then you came in and you wanted to run your method, you're just going to come into this list find the one that you just created, and everything will be populated as you had set it up. 
And all you might need to do now is maybe do another pre-scan to check the voltage is correct, or maybe change the scan area. If everything looks good and we're ready to go, we can just go ahead and hit scan. So again, you'll see these arrows moving around. It'll always scan sequentially. I always work off with the lowest wavelength to the highest wavelength, but it doesn't matter. You can put them in any order you like to do these multiplex scans. Again, on the right-hand side here, you'll see the histogram displaying the grayscale intensity distribution. And here it's going to be showing the 100,000 dot gel image, irrespective of which file format you chose to save. Right now you can see we have maximum intensity is 47,180 out of a potential 100,000. We can left click, drag and drop around a specific band or spot on the gel and see the particular pixel intensity related to that area. If we had any saturated pixels on the image, then it'd show up as a pink color. If you want to save the current contrasted image, let's say we really like what we're going on here, we can export that display, or we'll save as a JPEG, or we can print it out, which will be an exact copy of what you have here. And if you don't want that blue box, we just go back to clicking on whole area. And then if we want to give it a different name or a different destination, we can go to save as. And now you can decide which file format, whether you want to give it a different name or a different destination.